Thank you very much for joining me on this Friday afternoon here in the beautiful Canbar Recital Hall of Studzinski at Bowdoin College. That first piece you heard was by Helen Hopekirk, born in Scotland but immigrated to the United States in the early 20th century. She became an important figure both in terms of her pianism as a teacher, one of the first females to teach at the New England Conservatory in Boston, and as a composer. This was her most uh, popular work, and she often performed it as an encore at her own recitals, as well as as part of the larger suite. It's simply called Maestoso, from a work containing several movements that look back to the past. Several things we're gonna hear this afternoon, all by American women composers in honor of the 19th, the, hunt, the centenary of the 19th Amendment. Um, you're going to hear composers looking to the past. This next work uh, by the great American Amy Beach of New Hampshire um, is a beautiful work she simply entitles Dreaming. Um, she was considered one of the boys, as was said by the leader of the Boston Six back in the late 19th century, George Chadwick, who also hired Helen Hopekirk to teach at the New England Conservatory. He was the director at the time. Uh, very much respected Amy Beach and included her in all of the goings on of Boston musical life. She debuted with the Boston Symphony. Uh, and one thing that these women have in common is they showed uh, an amazing talent very early in their lives. So here is Amy Beach and her beautiful tone poem, Dreaming. <laughs> 
Thank you. This next composer, born Gussie Zuckerman in New York City, 1885, is a very unusual character. She ultimately changed, she took her last name, Zuckerman, turned Zucker to Zuka, man to manna, inverted them, and was known in her lifetime as the great philanthropist and music um, connoisseur and lover, Manazuka. So Manazuka was really a trailblazer among women of her time. Um, had an amazing career, not just as a pianist, but also as a world-renowned singer of musical comedies, as well as a prolific composer, both of piano, orchestral, and vocal works. Uh, she married and her husband managed her career. She ultimately ended up in Miami, and I know we have some Miami friends out there. I'm wondering if they know anything about her. She was iconic in the Miami classical music scene, having many of the world's foremost musicians in her home as they would travel on their tours. She knew all of them and was herself uh, a magnificent pianist. Ultimately, her singing took over her career. Um, and uh, she, she ended really by hosting concerts pretty much during the last part of her life. This is a very dramatic and very romantic work. She's simply called Prelude. Uh, it's probably deserving of a stronger title, but what a great piece um, by Manazuka, Prelude in C-sharp minor. Thank you. Some extraordinary women, all of whom lived during periods of women's suffrage in the latter half of the 19th century and into the early 20th century, we will celebrate the centenary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment on August 26th of this year. 100 years, but a long journey before women could not only have the right to vote, but decide on their reproductive rights as well as other things. Incredible to think that women were not either allowed to vote, own, or inherit property, or be on a jury uh, in court. 
extraordinary things happened during the first two decades uh, of the 20th century in this regard, and women gained that of freedom, although it would continue to be uh, a longer fight for particularly African-American women uh, during the 20th century, as we know. This next piece is unusual in that it comes, although popular during its time, it comes from a, a woman from Indiana who only ever composed six pieces in her lifetime, but happened to be connected with another one of the foremost women ragtime composers of the early 20th century. You're going to hear a rag called the Hoosier Rag, appropriate for a composer from Indiana, by Julia Niebergall, a very unusual uh, Germanic name, Niebergall. Um, she was one of the first women to own a, a car in the state of Indiana, um, kept her maiden name, very unusual for the time, uh, did not take her husband's name, and he was essentially managing uh, you know, the, the, the household while she worked and such. She smoked also, which was uh, so very much an iconoclast of her, of her, or, of her time. Uh, Julia Niebergall wrote, as I said, six rags. This one published in 1907. This was the heyday of, of ragtime with Joplin, already famous uh, in New York and around the world for his own ragtime music, like Maple Leaf Rag and The Entertainer, published just a few years before this one. So here is Hoosier Rag, which most rags are essentially a collection of rags. Um, for those of you who know the works of Frederick Chopin, his waltzes are essentially a collection of different waltzes, usually clumped into suites and stuck together in different keys. Um, so the form is very much taken from classical uh, structures. And all of these women were attracted and trained in classical music um, in their lifetimes and embraced the European forms but put their own individual um, history, music history and uh, oral history into it as well as their own personal uh, sort of you know, qualities. So here's the Hoosier Rag by Julia Niebergall. Great fun. Thank you so much. I mentioned that it would be much, much later and a much harder struggle for African-Americans American, in general, particularly African-American women, to make their way 
This next piece is by really the first important African-American composer, uh, female composer. Her name is Florentine Price. Born in Little Rock, she was part of the great migration from the South to the North, in her case from Arkansas to Chicago, where she was highly educated um, at Northwestern, won many awards, was the first African-American uh, woman composer to have a symphony premiered by a major orchestra. Very prolific. In fact, I believe I, I, I heard just recently that several boxes of manuscripts were discovered uh, in the last few years, maybe even in the last couple of years, uh, works that were thought to be lost. So we're all uh, anxiously awaiting what's in those boxes as scholars kind of go through them and um, hopefully put them together and publish them. Florence Price wrote many sort of uh, strong improvisatory works, and this is one of them. This is called Fantasy. Um, she wrote it early in the 20th century, uh, and we're going to hear from one of her pupils and friends at the end of the program, Margaret Price, who she, uh, Florence lived with when she moved to Chicago. Uh, the family embraced her and took in uh, she and her siblings and, and mother. So here is the fantasy of the great Florence Price. <laughs> 
Thank you so much. I neglected to mention some of the few places that African-American women could be musical were in houses of worship, particularly at least in Chicago in the Presbyterian and Methodist churches of Bronzeville and other suburbs. So a lot of the music of this era used spirituals and the spiritual that Florence used in this particular improvisatory fantasy was sinners don't let the harvest pass. Also, she wrote this during the year of the Depression, 1929, so an extraordinary time, and dedicated it to Margaret Bonds, who we're going to hear after this next composer. This next composer is a living composer, Jennifer Higdon, Grammy Award winning, extraordinary composer, teacher at the Curtis Institute of Music in Philadelphia. Um, she's probably one of America's uh, foremost com uh, composers uh, beyond gender and is very, very highly respected, has had premieres by all the major orchestras around the world. She's written a few works um, for the piano and uh, unfortunately I couldn't get the one that I wanted to play which she had written uh, as a commission for an important piano competition in Fort Worth, Texas, known as the Ven Clyburn International Piano Competition. She wrote a very interesting nine-minute piece. But I did find this very short uh, commission that she wrote for, um, she dedicated to her former composition teacher at Curtis, Edward Aldwell, but wrote it for premiere uh, of a work called 13 Ways of Looking at, at the Goldberg. Now, let me say, J.S. Bach wrote a very important set of keyboard variations, originally for the harpsichord, uh, which is a 17th, century, uh, 17th, 18th century instrument. Um, and the theme that he uses is called the aria. It's a very, very famous and very beautiful work. Um, starts like this. And so the Gilmore commissioned 13 composers to write a modern variation based on that beautiful theme. Each composer came up with a different version. Classical composers were asked, jazz composers, uh, world music, uh, co and other composers of other cultures. And um, it was collected in a book called 13 Ways of Looking at the Goldberg. I think it's a play on another poem um, by a famous American uh, poet whose name escapes me, oh, um, Wallace, um, you know who I mean. So Jennifer Higdon wrote this as a commission. It's very short and it's a little bit odd. It's a two-part invention essentially, which means that each hand has an independent voice. And I wanted to include this um, as a, an example of modernism as well. Um, Women composers of the last hundred years really have embraced every possible style. In our short little time together, I'm not able to demonstrate everything, but I wanted to give you at least a taste of, of, of a modern composer, uh, which I think is really important. Um, there are several uh, African-American composers, both male and female, of the early 20th century who embraced some of the more esoteric and modern styles and really refused to be um, labeled as a, a black composer, if you will. Um, and they didn't write anything using spirituals or what was thought of as black music at that time. Um, they wanted to be thought, uh, their works to be thought of on the, its own merit. Um, so it's interesting to, to follow that part of history as well. Uh, but here, Jennifer embraces uh, sort of a neo-Baroque style. Uh, looking back to the past as well for this fun little playful um, two-part invention. So here is the great Jennifer Higdon. 
Thank you so much. I think it's more about the play of the lines than it is about um, necessarily making a particular sense. The sense is in the playfulness, is the act of doing it, which I enjoy so much, that piece. And of course, knowing the aria, the original piece, as well as I do, it's wonderful to see her sort of touch it and then step away and touch it and step away. Uh, it's such a, a fun experience for someone who plays the piece. We're going to end this recital of American women composers in honor of the centenary of the 19th Amendment with one of the great um, African-American composers whose name is Margaret here, Margaret Bonds. Margaret Bonds um, took in Florence Price uh, in 1927. She was herself uh, a young girl just coming into her teenage years and really looked up to Florence, um, studied with her composition, herself very, very gifted. She had a much harder time in terms of building a career as a piano player, uh, so she eventually moved to New York where she befriended the great Harlem Renaissance poet Langston Hughes and set many of his poems to music. So one of her most important contributions to uh, art music in this country is the incredible amount of settings that she made of Langston Hughes poems. But she also wrote some wonderful piano works. Um, and I'd like to end my afternoon with you with her take on Wade in the Water. It was introduced to her. She played a version of it in church uh, when she was 10 years old. She talks about it and how much she loved it. So she took it on years later and wrote her rendition of Wade in the Water, which she called Troubled Waters. Very appropriate for the time. It has both, obviously, the, the, the historic spiritual quality to it, but also it has a bit of a Latin feel as well. Um, and, you know, Fats Waller, Gershwin, all the great pianist composers of the first part of the 20th century embraced what was called the Spanish tinge, but it was really the Latin rhythms that were coming out of Cuba and South America that inspired um, both ragtime and many composers, even of the great American songbook. Uh, Troubled Waters, a great tone poem uh, by Margaret Bonds. Um, I hope you enjoy it.
Thank you so much for sharing this short time with me, celebrating some of America's most wonderful composers, who happen to be women. Um, there's so much more music, and I think I'll do a follow-up performance of this at some point uh, and introduce you to, to some other uh, wonderful American composers, um, maybe of a more modern period, as well as some jazz composers who are, are, are really important in the, um, the history of our, of our music here. I'd also like to thank the alumni office for the invitation, as well as um, Tony Sprague, who organized everything and make sure that uh, it all goes off without a hitch. Thank you so much, and have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Bye-bye.